On January 13th, KSPS presented An Evening with Judy Woodruff. Judy was gracious with her time and insights. Our guests from Rockwood South Hill and those joining via Zoom provided the questions. And it was a great event. With Judy's insight on politics, the events of January 6th, and her memories of her late colleagues, Jim Lehrer and Gwen Eiffel. It was my honor to moderate the evening, and it's our honor to present to you an evening with Judy Woodruff. I'm thrilled to be with you. It's a Thursday night, as you know. I just got off the air after doing the news hour live here at our studio in Arlington, Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington, where the WETA studios are. This is where the news hours been broadcast for the last 45 years since Jim and Jim Lehrer and Robert McNeil started. We're in the same building. Um, and Gary, I don't know if you visited this building or not, but uh, you all are welcome to come at any time. We're actually building a new building or expanding the, the building around the corner. So we're gonna be in a different studio one of these days. Uh, but right now um, we are, as Gary said, in a very newsy period of time today. I have to say we, change the lead of the program at least once, and we were thinking about changing it twice, given the news of the day, the Supreme Court ruling on uh, the Biden administration uh, vaccine mandates. As you probably, I'm sure all of you have followed this, the Supreme Court was asked to look at two challenges to the Biden administration policy, one of them having to do with large employers with over 100 employees, the other one having to do with excuse me, having to do with healthcare workers, the court uh, by a, a vote of five to four sided with the administration on mandating vaccine for healthcare workers, but they sided against the administration uh, six to three um, with the conservative majority uh, prevailing uh, on, on the question of mandating vaccines for large employers or employers with over a hundred people. And um, it, I think in, in some respects, it wasn't so surprising because we listened. We Last week, we covered the justices as they had that hearing. But that became our lead as soon as that came down. We didn't know this morning what that was going to be. We were planning to lead talking about the pandemic um, and, and talking about voting rights, which, of course, is a major issue right now before the Congress. Uh, the administration, the Biden administration, the Democratic leaders in the House and the Senate are trying to get legislation passed, but they're running into a wall of opposition from uh, the Republican Party, which um, uh, just has a different point of view, and they don't even have enough support among Democrats uh, to change the rules so that a simple majority could pass it in the Senate. Without getting into a whole lot of detail on that, I'll just say that was going to be our lead, and we ended up spending a lot of time on that. I ended up talking to Lisa Desjardins, who was on the Hill today, and to Jeff Bennett, who is our new uh, correspondent, Washington correspondent. He joined us from NBC just a couple of weeks ago. So we are very, very glad to have Jeff Bennett joining us. Um, and we are, and he's also covering the White House right now. So that was a big part of the program. And then I interviewed Georgia United States Senator Raphael Warnock, who was just elected in, in 2020 to talk about voting rights. But beyond that, we had um, the Justice Department today moved against the, the group called the Oath Keepers. This is a, uh, uh, described as a far-right uh, government conspiracy group, uh, militant group. They were a big part of organizing the assault on the United States Capitol on January 6th of last year. And the Justice Department arrested and charged, I guess, 10 or 11 of the Oath Keepers, including their leader, with seditious conspiracy. It's the most serious charge so far. That the, that the government has leveled against any of the people involved. I guess there've been, what is it? 700 people have been arrested, but mostly it's been minor charges. Uh, but this one, this one is the most serious with uh, an assault on the, on the United States on the constitution. But um, so it's a jam packed period of time and we're doing it all. You, you wouldn't know it. I'm gonna reach over and show you what I wear around the building, this. <laughs> all day long. I don't wear it on the air, but um, I do wear it everywhere I go around the building. And in fact, right now they're urging us to wear the, um, the N95 masks, which as you all know, are these, I've got a box of them right here and I'm starting to make the transition to the safer mask. I don't have to tell all of you, COVID has completely upended everything we do. We all in March of 2020, almost on a dime, 
changed the way we broadcast the news hour. We had everything had been in the studio and occasionally remote guests, but suddenly overnight we went to home. And I did anchor from home, from my home in Washington, D.C., right across the river for a year from March of 2020 through April of 2021, at which point we decided it was safe because the COVID at that time seemed to be easing up and it seemed to be a safe time to come back. So I came back and started anchoring here in our studio downstairs. And then we gradually had um, a, uh, a collection of both correspondents and guests coming back in and we were you know, moving back toward normalcy. And then lo and behold, in the summer, along came the Delta variant with a very big, uh, actually it was, it was later in the spring, in the summer, uh, which, which of course had a big effect on all of us. I continue to come to the studio, keeping it safe, minimal people here, 98% of the news hour staff still works from home. They did, we still do, certainly with the Omicron variant right now, which is had a huge impact here in Washington, D.C. and up and down the East Coast. I know you on the West Coast, I believe, have had it a little bit later uh, than we have. So you're probably, you may not be at your peak. We're, we're being told right now we're right at our peak and we're about to start coming down. We can't wait for, for that to happen. I think everybody is really tired of this and we want life to get back to normal. But as I guess Dr. Fauci has said repeatedly, or maybe it's one of the other doctors at the White House have said, we may wanna be rid of COVID, but COVID is not finished with us. And we sure have found that out with all these variants and precautions and vaccine mandates and mask mandates and all the rest of it, the school, the crisis in the schools for our children. It's been heartbreaking to watch, you know, people's lives completely turned upside down. The fact that what is it, um, over 800,000 Americans have lost their lives? I mean, it's just almost impossible to imagine more than all the wars in, in our lifetime and beyond. So it's been sobering. Um, it's, caught, it's forced us to, to be nimble. We've had to adjust technically. And of course, we've had to adjust all of our reporting. We've shifted everything from... Um, you know, the usual diet of some politics and some economy and some um, uh, education and the rest of it. We're still covering all those things, but everything now almost seems to have a tinge of COVID. I mean, certainly some things are, are separate. What, what happens today on voting rights and whether the Congress is able to pass that, that's, uh, you know, is beyond the realm of COVID. But in fact, COVID affected how voting took place in many American cities and states um, in 2020, people were not, people were not, didn't feel safe at the polls. Uh, they had to extend voting days, expanded mail-in voting so that people who didn't, who couldn't get out of their homes could vote. But I guess my bottom line here is before I, I turn it over to all of you for questions, because I really do want to hear what you have to say and try to respond to your thoughts, um, is that it has been a time like no other. And all this has happened not just COVID, but the political division in this country, which is like nothing I've ever seen before, nothing I've ever covered. I've covered American politics now for almost 50 years. Hard for me to believe. It seems like just yesterday that I started out, but I've been covering politics for a very long time and I've never seen the country as politically divided as it is right now. And that makes it, I think, even more challenging on us at the news hour because our entire mantra is to try to reflect all sides of the story, to listen to everybody, to hear all sides. And yet when you get to a point where, um, frankly, facts are being thrown out the window and people are not telling the truth about what's going on, it makes it much, much harder for us to figure out the right way to report. But we keep trying, we keep trying to get it right. We are determined. We're not gonna give up <laughs> no matter what. Uh, we are dedicated to telling the story straight to bringing you the facts, and that's what continues to drive us. So um, I just want to say on behalf of all of us at the News Hour and my amazing team of correspondents, I could name them all. I mean, I think you know their names from Lisa Desjardins. I mentioned Lisa Amna Navaz, um, our new correspondent, Jeff Bennett, Jeffrey Brown, uh, John Yang, who tonight oversaw our coverage of the Supreme Court, William Brangham, um, and whom am I leaving out? 
Uh, we've just hired a, a wonderful young woman named Nicole Ellis to be our digital anchor. She's doing a great job. Stephanie Sai, of course, reports for us from Phoenix, Arizona. She anchors our West Coast news summary update and does interviews uh, for us. Um, Miles O'Brien, who covers science, Paul Salman, who covers the economy. I um, mean, you couldn't ask for a better, uh, just frankly, more remarkable lineup of journalists. And I'm so fortunate to work with each and every one of them. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you because we know that your support of public media um, in, in Washington State and the other Washington uh, in, in Spokane and the, the work that KSPS does is just so essential to our being able to do the reporting that we do. So um, I've spoken long enough. I'm going to give you a chance to, to ask me some questions. So fire away. I will be asking the questions. The audience has been sending them in for the last couple of days and certainly for the last hour or so. So we'll, we'll start with one that you touched on briefly. How do you balance the tension between striving to be and perceived to be fair and balanced in your questioning while also calling out the person who are interviewing makes statements that are blatantly and patently false? Um, Gary, it's a very good question. I'm not, I don't know. I don't think you gave me the name of the person who asked it, but if I could just say it's such an, it's such an important question. And it is one of the, the true challenges for journalism uh, for our time. That is for journalists who strive to be balanced, who strive to be um, straight and, and to let you decide. <laughs> you may, we, our view is you need to make up your own mind about you know, where you stand politically. We're here to give you the information. We're also here to hold public officials accountable. And when we know we're talking to someone who is saying something that isn't borne out by facts, uh, sometimes you could say, well, it's in dispute. You know, one side sees it one way, the other side sees it the other way. I, you know, we're not, I don't think it's our job to in, inject and interrupt every sentence and say, well, wait a minute, what about this? What? But we do need to hold officials accountable. And when we know, I mean, just to be, perfectly blunt about it, there are still a number of politicians who are arguing that the election was fraudulent in 2020, that President Biden is not the legitimate winner. Um, there is no evidence of that. There is no evidence The what is it, uh, 60 courts around the country, including judges who were appointed by President, former President Trump, have looked at the evidence uh, from one, one organization after another has looked at the evidence, it's not the case. And yet it continues to be the belief of, or the stated belief, I should say, of many politicians in this country, both at the state level and the national level. And, you know, it's our job as journalists to, to, to call that out, to say that's just can't be borne out. It's not, it's not factual. And it was interesting yesterday, um, or I should say a few days ago, that Senator, Republican Senator from South Dakota, whose name is Mike Rounds, Mike Rounds, um, gave an interview to another news organization, ABC on Sunday, in which he made a point of breaking with his party. He said, I'm gonna say right as of now that I know how the election turned out and I know that President Biden won and there's no evidence otherwise. And he cited chapter and verse. And then he was excoriated. Uh, for, for saying that by other members of his party. He was excoriated by the former president. Um, but that's just the, the time that we're in and it is our job. He's, a, he's an elected official, that's one thing. It's for us as journalists to continue to, to point out the facts and to be as factual and straight as we can. I am not gonna sit here and tell you that it's easy. It is difficult to conduct an interview. We had. One of my colleagues just last week interviewed a member of the House of Representatives from Texas, and he made several statements that are not factual. And she pointed them out in the interview. Um, but it's 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 a sensitive issue because in the news hour typically, I mean, our mantra is we treat people with respect, we let you finish your sentence, and we still do that. We believe in letting people get their point across, get their thought across. But we also know that it is our job to hold them accountable to the facts. And um, there's no blueprint for that. It's going to be different in every interview. And we have to 
uh, figure out the best way to do it every time. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer. I'm glad we're recording this because this is going to be a primer for young journalists everywhere. So thank you for for that response. Uh, here's a uh, here's one that I'm sure you can probably do relatively quickly or lengthy, depending on your point of view. How does your work day unfold? What's it like to be <laughs> Judy Woodruff day in and day out of the news hour? Oh my gosh. Well, um, five days a week, <laughs> it's up very early in the morning. Um, and frankly, it's looking at the news and what, you know, immediately, as soon as I'm awake, I'm listening to NPR and the radio uh, and trying to follow other news sources. I'm looking at newspapers. I'm looking online. I, um, I do get up early. I try to work out a couple of mornings a week to keep physically active because we're not getting around as much as we were. My husband happens to be a journalist too. His name is Al Hunt. He worked for many years for the Wall Street Journal and then for Bloomberg News. And he still is working as a journalist. He writes a column for The Hill, a digital newspaper, and also teaches a class. In fact, he just started teaching a, um, his, I guess this is his 18th or 19th year of teaching a, an undergraduate class in the media and politics at the University of Pennsylvania, but he does it remotely because of the pandemic. So he was in the in the dining room of our, of our, we live in a condominium in DC, um, talking to his students for three hours while I was in another room um, working on the news hour and, and so forth until it was time for me to drive from there to the studio. But what a day is like right now, Gary, is um, it's mainly working from home. I'm there most of the day, um, unless there's an interview that I need to go to, but Frankly, we are now in such safe mode that all interviews are remote. I interviewed the vice president of the United States last week, Kamala Harris, and I would have loved to have done that interview in person, but we decided it needed to be remote. So I talked to her. It was on Thursday. It was the day of the uh, remembering the insurrection at the Capitol. And she was in her office at the old executive office building, which is right next to the White House. And I was, I was um, in our studio here. Um, but I'm trying to just to quickly answer your question. I, I try to get a little bit of exercise, but basically I'm I'm on Zoom calls like this, or I'm on the phone, or I'm reading, or I'm uh, just getting trying to get caught up. And on a day like today, when the news is changing, when the Supreme Court makes an announcement, they made one announcement in the morning about one we considered minor decision, and then mid afternoon they let it be known that they were coming out with the decision on uh, the vaccine mandate. So we had to completely reshuffle the show. We had to bring in, you know, get, get John Yang. He kind of, I mean, he's been, you know, up preparing himself on the story and he covered the court arguments when they happened. So we knew he was the best position to, to handle this, but it was reassigning people, changing the show. Right now, and normally I would be driving home right now, but I'm talking to you and I am in my office. I come in here probably mid afternoon every day from home where I finished getting ready for the show. Nobody else is here. Our executive producer is at home. All of our producers are at home. Our correspondents are at home. Uh, the editors who edit the tape, the wonderful video you see on the show, most of them are working from home. We have become a, a home-based news program. Um, there are three people who work, sometimes four, in the newsroom, which is around the corner from me. Normally, there are 20-some people in there. Now, for the last two years, it's been three or four. They are the ones who put the guts of the program together um, in, in terms of the news summary and, and sort of shaping the program. But otherwise, everybody's at home. And we do everything by phone, by Zoom, by email, by text, by we have something called Slack and we have something called uh, Teams. I won't even bore you with all the different ways that we communicate with each other. But it's, it's different. And then I go home and I make some soup for dinner and, you know, keep reading and writing until I go to bed at night. You have been, well, let me rewind. Uh, and this, this is a question that I think a lot of us have been wondering about ever since it happened. But when the insurrection happened, and I know that we've just observed the unfortunate anniversary of that just recently, with we were, it started out as something that 
that was going to be a protest and turned into something a lot more challenging and more difficult as a news person and as a journalist to cover. So what was it like for you watching your colleagues in the middle of that? And what was it like for you as the person who is in charge of this team watching their work all day? It was sobering. It was frightening. And I will tell you, for those of you, I'm sure many, if not all of you, were glued to the screen that day, where whatever you were watching, we were carrying it live. You're right, Gary, we expected it to be a protest, but we were mainly focused on the electoral vote count inside the House uh, and the Senate, the House, the chambers, because that, that is normally a pro forma thing. Uh, we knew there were going to be some challenges, but we never dreamed that these protesters would be breaking into the Capitol and storming the building and trying to storm the House chamber. As you know, they did break into the, into the Senate chamber. Thank, thank God everybody got out safely. It was very frightening. But in the beginning of the day, we didn't know. I, if I remember correctly, we went on the air at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then I think it, as we got closer to 12, pre former President Trump was speaking to the group on the National Mall at noon Eastern. And then those people marched the Capitol and we watched the crowd build. I mean, the person, I, I mean, I'm in awe of my colleagues always, but on that day in particular, Lisa was the one, Desjardins, was inside the Capitol. She was, she was there like the rest of us. She thought she was there to cover the electoral vote count in the, in the House chamber, but instead, she ended up being there watching as they broke through the glass, reporting live for us. She was reporting with a small, she had her iPhone and a small camera. And she, it was one woman and there was no, she didn't have a camera crew or anything with her. And she was trying to talk to the insurgents, the rioters as they came in to understand why they were there and what they were doing. She was putting herself at, at serious risk. Thank goodness she didn't get hurt because as you, I'm sure you all know, they don't like the press, but she was very open about, I'm a reporter and I'm, you know, I'm asking you questions, but I, we were very worried about her. And then on the outside, Amna Navaz had been, um, first she had covered, been sort of down the mall. And then as the crowd built near the Capitol, she got somewhat closer, but she had an opportunity to see up close the kind of anger and uh, uh, she listened to the rhetoric the language they were using, and she was sharing that with us on the air. I was just, um, you know, I have to say I was worried for them. I was worried for our country, um, but it built. I mean, the morning, in the morning, we thought we were covering another day of, you know, a, a, a big day in the process of choosing a new president. They're, they're going to count the votes. Yes, these people are upset, but nobody knew they were going to break into the Capitol. So it was a horrifying thing to watch. Um, I was very worried. Yamish Alcindor, who, of course, as all of you know, has been with us for several years. She just, we've lost her to NBC. We wished her well. We, uh, you know, she's been like one of the family, but we're, you know, we know she's going to go on to do great things. She will continue to anchor Washington Week in Review, which is great for PBS. But we, we do miss her at the news hour. But that that day, she was stationed at the White House, so she was really our go-between with the White House staff and reporting on what the president was doing, the people around him. So she played a very essential role for us as well. But it was, I mean, the bottom line is it was a day like no other. Uh, this is from Jan in the audience. Who is, in your opinion, the most capable or surprisingly capable member of President Biden's cabinet? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I want to think about that. Um, I think I probably, you know, it's going to be very hard for me to pick one person. Um, I think, let me just throw out one name, Janet Yellen. She was the former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve. A very important role, the first a woman to hold that position, now held, as you know, by Jerome Powell. Um, she was not reappointed by former President Trump, so she didn't have a, a day job, if you will. When President Biden was elected, he asked her to serve as Secretary of the Treasury. So she's gone from one very big job. She had been a Fed governor for many years until 
uh, President Obama named her uh, to be chair of the Federal Reserve. She held that job and now, as you know, she's now Secretary of the Treasury. I, I have to say that, you know, it, that's a very tough job. The, the economy has been turned upside down by, by COVID. Uh, I can't imagine a tougher time. She was at the, you know, she's been sort of in the middle of it as COVID hit and now very much still in the middle of it as, as COVID waxes and wanes. And as we watch what happens with the economy, with people leaving jobs, we now have so many jobs that are going unfilled. The unemployment rate is at historic lows, but inflation has gone up. They say it's temporary. It's not going to last It's because of the supply chain. But she's dealing with a lot as the chief economic person uh, in the cabinet. So I, I would name uh, Janet Yellen as someone of consequence, no question. Um, and there are others. I mean, I, I think someone interesting to watch is Gina Raimondo, who's the Secretary of Commerce. She's the former governor of Rhode Island, and a little state, um, but she um, uh, has, I think, gotten a lot of attention for her, her communication skills, and um, I think she's somebody to watch. I could go down the list. I don't think you want me to do that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the, somebody who's going to get a lot of attention is the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. He, of course, ran against Joe Biden for the presidency and did a lot better than a lot of people thought he would. Former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. So he didn't have a Washington job and he wasn't a governor, but he, he really projected himself on the national stage in a way that I think people take him very seriously. And I think there's a lot of speculation about whether he will run for president again in the future. So speaking of that, the, we have a question here from the audience. What do you think of polls? Are they accurate? Are they worthwhile? That's a big question. As somebody who covers politics, um, I will tell you very candidly, I think we depend too much on polls. I, you know, I've, I've, we came from a time where I remember back in, the, back in the day, decades ago, there were only a handful of polls. There was Gallup, there was Harris, and then eventually, you know, the newspapers, the big newspapers and the television networks uh, started paying for their own polls. And of course, there've always been private polls done you know, that, that simply serve the candidates, the political parties. Um, but now there are so many polls. Uh, you look at any website that follows polls and you just, your eyes start crossing because there's so many of them. In my view, there are some that are more trusted and, 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 and polls that I pay more attention to than others. But here's my bottom line, is I think for all of us, what matters is the poll, is the, the trend of polls. It's not that somebody's up two points or down a point. It's overall, what's the trend? Um, and I, but I'll go back to my first comment when you asked me that question. I think we spend way too much attention on polls. I think we, we let them govern too much of how we cover things. I think, yes, it matters what people think and we should pay attention to that. That's, we wanna know what people think, but I think there are other ways of finding that out. We need to interview more people like all of you. We need to go to the source, talk to voters. Um, uh, and I think, you know, we just need to be careful in the media about letting polls determine um, what, what, we, what we take stock, I mean, what we put stock in. I think, um, they just are way too overdone. I, mean, I think they play a role, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't be at the center of everything. So a little bit of inside baseball here, but this, I think it's a valid question. You've had the opportunity to moderate several presidential debates. Uh, what was that like? And are there any stories that you care to or can share? Wow. Well, I love remembering it. You're right. I've interviewed, I've, I've done more and moderated more or been a questioner, but more presidential candidate debates than I can possibly remember. Most of them have been primary debates. Of course, the presidential debates, those are the few and far between. They're every four years. They are typically run by the Commission on Presidential Debates, although actually there was news about that today because the Republican National Committee, the headquarters of the Republican Party announced that they will no longer allow their nominee to um, participate in a debate sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Who knows whether that's serious 
or whether it will persist into 2024. We're still, what, three years away from the next president, almost three years away from the next presidential election. So we'll see. But I have moderated a lot of them and I've got a lot of memories, both uh, awkward and good and bad. I mean, one thing is uh, that I will confess with you, there's nothing smooth or predictable about a debate. They are, I mean, I remember being so afraid. I was uh, shaking in my shoes. Um, the first time I was asked to moderate uh, a candidate debate, I think I started when I was a local reporter in Atlanta covering Georgia politics. I interviewed a couple of, or rather moderated a couple of state debates. And those were nerve wracking enough. But when I started at the national level, um, it, it, uh, I, I will say this, that I lost my cool probably. Um, here's, here's the most memorable moment, though, in all the debates that I've moderated. This was 1988. Take you back to 1988. Um, President Reagan is leaving office. Who's running for the Republican nomination? It's George, his vice president, George H.W. Bush. He's won the nomination, and he chooses, uh, we find out that summer, he's, choo he's chosen Dan Quayle, the relatively little known senator from the state of Indiana to be his running mate. And on the other side, the Democrats uh, had chosen Michael Dukakis, who had chosen uh, this prominent longtime senator from the state of Texas, Lloyd Benson, to be his vice presidential running mate. So here I am, I'm the moderator along with four other reporters. Uh, Tom Brokaw of NBC was one of them and there were others, Tom, I mentioned Tom because you would know his name. Um, and we're moderating the vice presidential debate. So it's Dan Quayle squaring off against Lloyd Benson, 1988. And Dan Quayle is uh, having to uh, deal with a lot of skepticism, I'll put it that way, on the part of voters about his lack of experience because he wasn't well known. He'd only served in the Senate, I guess, for one, not even a full term. And, um, and he was taking a lot of heat uh, for his lack of experience. So when I started the debate, my first question was to him about experience and he, you know, he said whatever his answer was. But of course this issue came up again later in the debate. And when it came up, um, uh, Senator Benson uh, was, was poised and ready because when, when, at this point in the debate later on, when Senator Quayle was asked about his lack of experience, he said something that he'd started to say on the campaign trail. He said, um, you know, remember, you know, John Kennedy, he served in the Senate uh, for a short time before he was, you know, moved up to the presidency. And I, you know, I think about that as I think about my own challenge. So here comes Senator Benson shoots right back. He said, Senator, I knew John Kennedy uh, I serve with John Kennedy and Senator, you are no Jack Kennedy or however he put it, at which point the room erupted. I mean, the debate stage erupted, uh, you, know, you know, it was in, it was in uh, uh, one of those moments that you just won't forget. And, and, you know, I think a lot of us thought, wow, boy, that's really uh, a serious blow for Dan Quayle. And, you know, boy, Dukakis is just not, you know, he's not going to, He's not going to survive this. Well, lo and behold, of course, it ended up not mattering because what really mattered, what the lesson from this is the lesson of so many debates. You can have a really bad moment, but unless it's a truly defining, horrible moment in a presidential debate, it's not, it's not going to kill you. I, I think Michael Dukakis had his own bad moment with my former CNN colleague, Bernie Shaw, when Bernie asked him, you know, what it was, it was a question about the death penalty and Bernie uh, asked uh, um, Governor, then Governor Dukakis, what would he do if Kitty Dukakis, his wife, had been raped and murdered, and would you be in favor of the death penalty? And Dukakis, sort of very by the books and very businesslike and lawyer-like, said, no, I believe, I don't believe in the death penalty, and he didn't show any emotion, and, um, and that ended up hurting him in the debate. But, uh, but in terms of vice presidential debates, no matter how you know, how much one side may show up the other, you know, they, they end up not being controversial. But there have been a lot of them and there will continue to be them. And um, I think candidates are, are getting better and better at figuring out how to, 
how to master them, but we'll see. We'll see in this coming, we've got lots of them coming up this year. It's an election year again with the Senate and governors. So speaking of our elected officials, uh, there's a question from the room audience. Is there anything that we as citizens can do to facilitate a Congress that works for the good of the country and not just the political parties? Wow, that's a big question. Um, that sounds like someone who believes the Congress isn't doing that right now. Um, uh, and it is true that Congress has pretty low public opinion ratings. Um, it's a it is a big question. And we are dealing, as I mentioned a moment ago, and all of you know this very, very well, with a very a fraught and divided moment in American political life. Um, we have one point of view, the Democrats hold one set of views, and the folks who support former President Trump and who don't believe President Biden was legitimately elected hold another set of views. And then you've got some Republicans and some folks in the middle who, you know, would argue, yes, Joe Biden won, but I don't really like what he's doing as president. He's made some moves that I think are too, um, uh, that, that are injecting the government too much into um, our lives. And you see that with the move on, on the disagreements over COVID, the mask mandate, the attempt to pass the so-called Build Back Better legislation, which is, uh, what was it? It started out at six trillion, then it went down to four or three, and now it's 1.8 uh, or less, and it's still not passed, but it's an attempt to um, beef up, frankly, uh, some of the social services in our country around education, around healthcare, environment, um, in many ways. And Republicans have, uh, en masse, have said, this is wrong, we don't like it. Uh, and, and the parties are at loggerheads. As you've watched, President Biden has said it's a priority, he's not getting it through. But what we've been watching in the Congress is, um, uh, you know, an inability to work across the aisle. The moderates don't, moderates, people who are in the center don't get elected. <laughs> anymore. People who get elected today tend to be from more of the wings of their party. Um, those are the sides that they can raise more money as they run for office. Uh, they somehow get more enthusiastic backing from advocates and supporters. And so who comes to Washington are the fierce partisans. And they're people who don't want to work with the other side. And frankly, they're hearing from American voters who put them in office that they don't want them to compromise. That didn't used to be the case. People used to say, I want you to go to Washington to get stuff done. Now, many Americans are saying to their elected representatives, I want you to go to Washington and I want you to stick to your gun. I don't want you to sit down and I want you to go have coffee or lunch or dinner with a member of the other party. I just want you to represent my point of view. And frankly, that's where we are. We are in a very polarized uh, environment. Um, I, think, I think to a large degree, Republicans have driven this, but I think Democrats have also certainly uh, had their share of, of strong partisan views. And right now we're in a place where the two sides are just not getting a whole lot done. I mean, I listened today to a news conference by Speaker Pelosi, at least most, some of it, most of it. Then I listened to a news conference by the Republican House leader, Kevin McCarthy of California, but well, they're both from California. And you would have thought they came from different planets and they are completely uh, opposite in their views. The things they say about each other and about um, the president, I mean, what I heard McCarthy say about the president, um, was would curl your hair. <laughs> um, they are they are at they are at odds, and the parties are at odds. and And why is it? It's because the people who vote in this country don't want them to compromise, don't want them to work together. At least not enough of them do, and they reflect that in the work they do in Washington. They are here. Believe me, they are here. This is not Washington speaking. This is 50 states and, you know, what is it, 360 million Americans speaking. 
through these elected members, at least the folks who vote. But it's a reminder to me to get to the point of your question. If you want members to represent your point of view, get out and vote and tell your friends to vote. Because if you don't vote, we're going to have elected people who, um, you know, who don't represent your point of view. And we have, and maybe some of you want, you know, don't want your side to compromise. That, that's a position that we can have. It's a free country. It's a democracy. People are not in lockstep. We don't hold a gun to your head and say, you will support this or that. We, we're allowed to have these debates. Um, and they're healthy. They can be healthy. But right now, we're not even having debates. We're just having shouting matches and screaming at each other with rare exception. It's not that they don't work together on anything. They do work. But on some of the big issues, um, and certainly they worked together in the very beginning on COVID during the Trump administration when the country was suffering so much. It was, it was torturous, but they finally got legislation passed to get assistance out there and thank God that they did. Or a lot of people would have lost their homes, they wouldn't have been able to take care of their family, jobs just disappeared overnight. So thank God they did pass that. But we're, we're in a very difficult place and the only solution is for people to vote and, and get involved, get engaged. Weigh in. There's a question from Jim, who's in the room. Is our democracy really under threat from within? I think it is. And I am um, very uh, sorry and, and uh, sad to have to say that. But when I see, um, how do you look at what happened to the Capitol last year and the threats? Uh, to our elected members of Congress and not view that as an attack on our democracy. And many of the people who participated and many more say that they still believe that violence is justified uh, in pursuing their point of view. And there have been, speaking of polls, there were some polls done recently where people were asked, do you think violence is ever justified? And the percentage of people who believe it in, in both political parties is up from what it was. So I think that's, I mean, it gives me, I mean, it pains me to say this, but I do think our democracy is under some threat. Um, I always want to believe I'm the eternal optimist. I, I want to believe we're going to work our way through this. We're going to get, we're going to come back together as a country. It's not going to be kumbaya, but at least we're going to be able to, you know, to, to, to work through our problems. But when the two sides are not even talking to each other, um, uh, I mean, I remember when uh, during the Reagan administration, when uh, I think it was Alan Greenspan and some other Democrats and Republicans came together and worked out, uh, there was a Social Security Commission appointed to figure out ways to extend the, the, the life of Social Security, which, of course, so many Americans depend on it, and they were able to do it in a bipartisan manner. Uh, you've seen Republicans. I mean, here's another example. Republicans going back to the to 1965 have supported voting rights in this country. I mean, under Republicans support, it went, went along with Democrats in 1965 and every president since then, Republicans and Democrats have supported voting rights in every Congress that's voted. And the last time that they were able to agree was I believe under George W. Bush in 2006, he signed the last extension of the Voting Rights Act, and it was 2000, I believe this is right, 2005 or 2006, Republican President George W. Bush. Here we are 15 years later, they are completely divided on the question of voting rights. This is in the aftermath of the 2020 election, of course, but Democrats are here, Republicans are there. Demo Republican run state legislatures around the country are changing laws to tighten up uh, voting rules. Democrats are passing laws that do uh, what they say increase voter access. In Washington, Democrats want to do one thing. Republicans say that's wrong, and it would uh, do damage to the country. Um, I mean, that, there you have it. I mean, for for what is it from 1965 until 2006? What is that? 50 years. Uh, the two parties worked together, or even more than 50 years. And here we are 15 years later and it's changed. So I'm the eternal optimist. I am not one to give up on any, on our 
democracy, we have the most, what was it Winston Churchill said, um, democracy is the, um, he, he was talking about the, the messiness of democracy and how it's the worst form of government on earth, except for all the others that don't have democracy. Yes, it's messy. You don't want to see the sausage being made. Um, and yes, people, um, you know, can, can really feel disenfranchised by our democracy, but we have to keep at it. We have freedom, we freedom to vote and let's not let that slip away and let's not let people go after our elected officials. Let's respect our constitution. Let's respect the right to vote. Let's respect um, if, if the vote count is done, no matter how, look what happened in the year 2000, <laughs> how close we came, the Supreme Court came and said, no, wait a minute, you know, Florida, we're going to look at Florida this way and not that way. And George W. Bush is the winner. And what happened? Al Gore stood before the cameras and said, I accept it. That's, that's a democracy. The loser accepts it. But that's not what we have right now. And um, we'll see where we go from here. I hate to be a downer, but um, I, uh, the only thing that turns it around, though, is, is the American people. The American people have to you know, stand up and say, we believe in our Constitution. We believe in the democratic way of getting things done. We, our freedom is precious, and we're not going to let this go away. We are going to stand up and, and defend it. And that's how we're going to keep at it. Thank you, Judy. I have one comment and one last question. Uh, the comment is from our friend Judy, who is a member of our governing board here at KSPS. And she wants you to know that she's a KSPS PBS supporter from Canada, Calgary, Alberta. And she wonders if you're aware of how many followers we have and you have from Canada. We turn to KSPS and PBS for our understanding of an intelligent and balanced view of American news. So. You can take that back to the newsroom and, and share that. And I will share that. Question, Thank you. And one last question, and this one's from me. Um, you have had the chance to work with a number of iconic journalists over the years. And I wonder if you would give us a little bit of an insight into what it was like working with Jim Lehrer and, more importantly, our good friend Gwen Eiffel. Wow. Well, you name two, two of the icons of our time. Um, I mean, Jim was someone who was a mentor to me, um, hired me in way back in 1983 to join this program. I had been at NBC News, but heard that Jim and Robin were starting this hour-long news program. And they took a leap and hired me. <laughs> um, to be their Washington correspondent, uh, brought me on board here in Washington, in fact, the office where I'm sitting now was Jim's office um, back then. Um, but Jim was just as solid as they come. Uh, I mean, you, what you saw is what you got, although you know, it is true that Jim was more serious probably on air than he was in person. For any of you who are fortunate enough to meet him, you know what, a, what an incredible human being he was. And maybe Gary, you got to know him over the years. And of course we lost Jim last year, we were very sad to lose him. And then Gwen, of course, was just a magical human being. Um, I got to know Gwen. I knew Gwen as a friend, but then when I rejoined, I left the news hour uh, back in uh, the early 90s, rejoined the news hour in uh, the early in 2007. And by that time, Gwen had been here for a few years and she was uh, reporting in Washington and also uh, anchor, uh, moderating Washington Week. And just was the privilege of my life to get to work with this luminescent, brilliant, um, iconic, uh, just remarkable human being who was just so smart and so full of life and so strong, who put up with all kinds of, uh, you know, incredible uh, opposition and, con and, and uh, criticism from her earliest days in, as a young black woman trying to make her way in journalism at a time when that was the exception and not the rule. She put up with it all and she prevailed and she became um, the, the star and the, 
the leader that she was in journalism. And it was just a, you know, the heartache uh, that continues to this day that we lost Gwen so young, so early in 2016, she passed, you know, just within days after the election uh, uh, because of cancer. But um, she, was, she was truly remarkable. And to this day, she sets a standard uh, for all of us at the news hour and beyond, Gary, um, in, in her belief in the importance of a, of a free press, in the importance of a diverse press that looks like America, <laughs> that is as, um, as diverse as the American people are, and that holds uh, our elected officials accountable. And that is dedicated to telling the truth. It's as basic as that. But I'm so glad to that you asked me about Jim and about Gwen, of course, uh, two very, very special people. And I am so proud to say that they both left, have left a legacy that lives on and will continue to live on uh, for long into the future here at the News Hour. This has been a, a great conversation, Judy. Thank you for, for taking the time and know that you have many, 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 many friends on both sides of the border who look forward to the news hour and who appreciate and marvel at the work that you and your team do every day. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for now being part of our KSPS family. And uh, we look forward to seeing you down the road. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you all. It's great to see you. Uh, uh, one of these days I'll get back out to your neck of the woods. Um, in person um, and hope to do that uh, before long. But in the meantime, just thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you about what we do. I appreciate it. And thank you to everything KSPS does. Let's give them a hand too. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Well, Good this night, has been everybody. a long day. It's been a long day for you. Thank you for taking the time. For sure. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.